Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. I may not know your name, where you live, or anything else about you, but there is one thing that I know absolutely concerning who you are, and that is you are someone who believes in God. Now, how can I say that? Every human being believes in God. Now, they may deny that, but when someone says, I don't believe there's a God, I'm an atheist, I think all of this God talk is foolishness. Well, in actuality, what they're saying is against what they truly believe inwardly. We need to realize something. Many times today, there's a tendency to believe that simple faith, what, for example, a child is taught concerning God, that that is immature, and when someone grows up, and they start getting educated in the world, when they start listening to science and such, that they turn away from believing in God. That is a false narrative. No one turns away from belief in God because of science or because they become more intelligent or anything like that. People become defiant against God, but that doesn't mean they do not believe in God. And how can I make such statements? Well, take out your Bible and look with me to Psalm number 14. The book of Psalms and Psalm 14. Now, I can even offer some scientific evidence for this. I've shared before that many, many years ago, there was an institution, a university in California, and they did a test. Now, we all know what a lie detector test is. You hook someone up to this machine and they monitor that person's reactions inwardly, stress and such, and very accurately, they can discern if someone's speaking the truth or if someone's lying. And in this example, they took a thousand individuals who all had something in common. They said that they were atheists. They said they did not believe in God, that this was a fairy tale, fantasy, and they rejected any thought that there was literally a God. And what were they asked? What was the primary question that they were asked when they were hooked up to this lie detector test? Do you believe in God? And around 98% of the people when they said because they were all atheists so their response would be no I don't believe in God and 98 percent failed meaning even though they said they did not believe in God inwardly they did when they say we deny the existence of God they were lying now we don't need to use a lie detector test we can just turn to Scripture. And as I said, we're going to be looking today in Psalm 14. And this is a psalm that David wrote. It says in the first part of verse 1, Lam Natser le David, to the chief choir director of David, meaning David wrote this. And notice what he says. Amar Naval Belibo. Now, the word naval, most Bibles translates it a fool. But we need to understand what it speaks to. It is a fool not because of a lack of intelligence. It is someone who is foolish because he knows something, 
but he doesn't respond to that information. Classic example is someone's house is on fire. And an individual comes in and says to the homeowner, your home is on fire. Everything's going to go up in a matter of minutes. He has that information, and he does not move. He does not respond to the house being on fire. And he's consumed. Well, this is what Naval is. They have information, but they reject it. They deny it. They are defiant. They do not respond to what they know to be true. And the question we have to ask ourselves, why is that? And David's going to get into that. Once more, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now he's convincing himself. He's trying to make that statement. He is thinking that way. Why? Why is it so important for him to think that there is no God? Well, it's the next part of this scripture that tells us this. Notice the next phrase. Hishchitu. What's that? It is a word for corruption. In this context, it speaks about wrong living. And if you keep reading, it's not just that, that they have become corrupt and they do abominable things. But notice what it's saying here. He says, I deny God. That's what a fool says. I don't believe in God. Inwardly, he knows it's true. There is a God. But he convinces himself, he states publicly, there is no God. Why? Because he wants to do that lifestyle that is corruptible. That lifestyle that is abominable. He wants to do deeds that are not in line with the truth of God, the instructions of God, the commandments of God. So what does he do to try to justify himself, both inwardly and publicly? He just says, there's no God. Therefore, if there's no God, there's really no exact concept of right and wrong. There's no truth. You can have your truth. I can have my truth. You can say, this is fine, this is proper to do, and I can have something totally different. See, when God is in the picture, it is not important what I call truth, what you call truth, what's important? His truth. Because His truth is the only truth. It is His terms for righteousness and justice, that which is holy, good, proper, moral, ethics, they all come from his word. But if I don't like his righteousness, I don't like his justice, I don't like his will, what do I do? Well, a foolish person simply says, I deny God. I'm defiant against him. And therefore, because he doesn't exist, everything's fine. So the motivation here for this one to say, there is no God trying to convince himself is because he wants to perform both corruptible and abominable deeds, not according to God's will. Look on the last part of verse 1. En ose tov. There is no one doing good. That's the issue. People who say there is no God, they will not do that which is good. When you lack belief in God, when you deny that, reject that, we know something, that you are doing so, so that you do not have to be associated with his will, with his purposes. You want to practice that which is corruptible and abominable according to God's ways, according to his truth. So it's just out of convenience that someone says there is no God. Now, we can go off on a brief tangent. We see in the New Covenant, there's a very important word. The Hebrew word for this, matzpun, is conscience. And everyone has a conscience. And therefore, that conscience tells that person that there is a God. So when someone says, oh, I'm an atheist, or I used to believe, but I've outgrown that. 
I, I'm too mature for that. Science proves to me that, that this is all false. When someone says that, they are lying to themselves. Now, verse 2. We saw his response. What does God do? The Lord from heaven looks down upon the sons of men to see something, to see if there is, and the next word, maskil. What is a maskil? Well, it's interesting to note that, that sechel yeshar is common sense. And this word for someone who is wise, sometimes this word can relate to prosperity, but it has to do with an intelligence that is natural. That which one is divine, endowed with by God. So he wants to see is if there is among human beings individuals that are utilizing that. That's the context. There are those who say, and they're foolish, there is no God. So that they can do offensive, ungodly, corruptible, abominable acts. But God looks to see if there's anyone who is wise using what we call in English common intelligence in order to, and the point here is this, that this is what God has given a person in order that they can function and move towards a greater understanding of the truth of God. So the Lord from the heavens, he looks upon the sons of men, and this word for looking is not the same one later on in the text, but it's a word for he looks and he reveals in a very transparent way. He gets to the heart of how people think. To think if there's anyone who with, with just common sense, if they are behaving. And what is one who is going to be operating in the conscience that God gave to that person? And someone who's going to, to behave in a way that leads to prosperity. And here again, prosperity, taking hold of the things of God, accomplishing his purposes. What does that lead to one who has that desire? Well, notice the end of verse 2. Doresh et Elohim. He seeks, and this word Doresh is an intense word. Many times we translate it as seeking, asking. But it's a word of, of, of almost demanding. It shows a strong desire, even a desperation for, what does it say here? For God. And there's a change. Instead of the Lord, yud heh vav -Hey, we have the term God. And remember, I say this frequently, this is related to God who is judge. He who has common sense, this this endowment from God of intelligence to know that God is, that he exists, and that leads him to want to, if God is real, and I know he is, then if I'm not foolish, I'm going to want to know how to serve him, what he requires of me. I am going to seek that with a passion, with a fervency to be someone that God is pleased with. Move on to verse 3. This is the norm. But all turn away together. And once again, we see a similar word, a synonym for they have become corrupt. Now, this is a word that speaks about decay, but it's more of a moral decay. And that's what we see going on in our society in a rampant way. Rapidly, people are becoming more and more corrupt in their actions and that all begins with how they're thinking why well notice the relationship between the scripture it says here that that those if they seek god they are going to be acting on a common sense what god has put within us in our conscience in order to seek him find him serve him glorify him and be blessed by him that's the order that God expects, that he works with, with humanity. But what does the vast majority of people do? 
they turn aside rapidly from him they behave corruptly and notice he says it a second time and say tov there are not those that are doing good verse 4 surely now based upon these individuals who individuals individuals say there is no god i want to live corruptly i want to do abominable things i want to turn away from god i want to pursue the desires of my will i do not want to do that which is good according to god and they know something look at verse 4 surely they know who are we talking about all the workers of iniquity now that's what they are when you deny god you will become a worker of iniquity just that simple it is only when you acknowledge god not just in your heart in your mind not just with your word but you begin to acknowledge him with decisions life decisions what you do the priorities of your life when you acknowledge god in this way you are going to be doing his will manifesting that which is right that which is proper that which is good but when you say there is no god what's going to be the outcome you will be in activity and that's literally what it says all who and the word here is uh does or functions in iniquity and notice what happens now when i love god that love of god is going to manifest itself with love of neighbor i'm going to want to be helpful i'm going to want to be a blessing to others i will have a greater concern for someone else than oneself that is faithfulness that's what god leading a person does it's that same attitude and paul puts it this way let the mind that was in messiah that caused him to humble himself empty himself even to the point of death and death on a cross let the same mindset be in you so it's all picking up our cross dying to self in order that we can be a blessing to others and that's why look carefully at the scripture that is the the torah character love god love your neighbor but these individuals they're not at all under the authority of the torah now we're not saved by the law the commandments do not justify us but having been saved having experienced justification i am going to want to utilize the truth of the torah the truth of the commandments of god the relevance of why god gave these commandments i'm going to want to apply them to my heart in my lifestyle so i can be a blessing to others that i can be like god not become god that's heresy but behave like him manifest his will in my life but what are these people doing who deny god they are participating in iniquity and notice what it says they are the ones who are eating my people that means devouring it is behaving in a situation whereby you are exploiting others and they do it as they're eating bread now that is expression eating bread is just natural I mean, we eat bread, and bread is just a synonym here for food. People eat two, three times a day. And what it's saying is, just as common and natural for a worker of iniquity that he sits down and eat, so too does he go and exploit, take advantage, harm other individuals. And who is that? My people. God takes it personally. But the Lord, notice what it says at the end of verse 4, the Lord they do not call they don't seek him they're not interested in him nothing in their life reflects any any awareness of god and therefore they exploit individuals verse 5. now verse 5 tells us that when we become 
selfish. It leads to a form of paranoia. It's just that simple. When I become consumed with myself, I'm going to think others, they're behaving that same way, and in the same way, I devour other people, exploit them, use them for my purpose. I'm going to assume inwardly that people are trying to do that same thing against me. And what's the outcome of that? Well, we could use a, a word of psychology, paranoia. But you know what the Word of God says? He uses the word, verse 5, fear. There. And that behavior and that lifestyle, there, fear, they fear. For God, and they realize something. Now, this goes back and confirms exactly where we begin, and that is everyone, everyone knows inwardly God exists. Why is that? Well, I mentioned that he put that conscience within a person. That person has a soul. That person, because God created him, that person has a connection with God. He knows that God exists. And he knows that God is a holy and a righteous God. Now, their understanding of holiness and righteousness in and of themselves might be, be severely marled by their sin. But, but in some way, they know that God is good, that he is holy, that he is righteous. And they also know something else that there is a day of judgment. There's a day that people are going to have to give an account. Now, they see this in this world. People are evaluated constantly by their, their boss, their employer, by, by friends. We evaluate each other. Is this person, is this person a, a, a truly a friend? Is this person someone I can trust? Am, am I someone that's trustworthy to that person? We evaluate others, we evaluate ourselves. That's just natural because we understand that there is this concept of judgment. Judgment in the sense of evaluating, discerning, but based upon that evaluation, that discernment, there's going to be an outcome. Another way we can think about it is payday. There is a day that Things are going to be set in order. And therefore, look carefully at this. It says, for God, and once again, it uses God and this, this God as the judge. For God is in the generation of the righteous. Now, what is the generation of the righteous? Well, it is an idiom for the generation that God judges it's all this whole section here causes us to remember there is a day of judgment and that causes individuals who say there is no god i'm not going to live for him i don't believe him i'm not going to use his truth i'm not going to use his standards they are inwardly fearful they have what we could call a spiritual paranoia they do not know that peace that contentment, when you become selfish, it robs you of joy. And they have fear because God, there is that generation of righteous. Verse 6, the counsel. Now, this has it's the word counsel, but we need to understand it as instruction. God, when someone, now many Bibles, the next word is the Hebrew word, Ani with Ein, not Aleph. What's the difference? Ani with Aleph is I. But with an Ein, it means one who is poor or one who has been afflicted, one who is suffering. And in this sense, I believe that we should take it in a very general way, an afflicted one. Now, God has instructions for those who are being afflicted by the world. And notice what it says here. The, the counsel or the instruction of the afflicted one, what does the one who deny God 
What do they believe about that? They do something. They, they uh, uh, reject it. They, they think it has no worth. They, they believe it's shameful. It's worthless. So they put no value whatsoever upon it. And that's what they do because, here's the problem, if they didn't, then they're going to realize their defeat. And they don't want that. So they say God's counsel, his instructions for those who are afflicted in this world. There is no God, so his instruction, they put no preference, no significance on it whatsoever. But what do we know? For the Lord, he is his refuge. So in the end, God will be a refuge to the one who embraces and implements God's counsel. Now, here's where wisdom is seen. Wisdom is seen with taking the counsel of the word of God, his principle, precepts, instructions, commands, all of that. That's all of his counsel. That's his instruction. Applying it to my life. Because when I do that, it positions me in a safe place, in his refuge, in his safe place. And what that speaks of is that God becomes my defense. That's the idea here. And, and the psalm speaks about this in many different places. One more verse. Look at verse 7. Now, verse 7, the last verse, ends with a a statement of encouragement that there's not only coming judgment not only will God be a refuge for the one who trusts in him but there is coming the establishment of the kingdom of God with God's judgment comes him putting things in order and that perfect order is going to be experienced within his kingdom so let's conclude. Look at verse 7. Me yiten, me tzion. Who will give me tzion from Zion? Now, I would circle that word Zion because Zion, it is a kingdom word. Now, it relates to Jerusalem in location, but not spiritual condition. Jerusalem, we know, we see this in the book of Revelation. Jerusalem in the last days. It is going to be like Sodom and Egypt. But through redemption, Jerusalem is going to be transformed. And this transformed Jerusalem is Zion, Zion. So he's asking here, David is speaking, who will give, we can think of it this way, who will bring about from Zion? Now, when he says from Zion, the implication is, the promises of the kingdom, the blessings of the kingdom. Who, who's going to bring this about? And what do we call these promises, these blessings from the kingdom? Well, Yeshua Yisrael, the salvation of Israel. Now, I'm going to say it again because it's so vital that we get things right. Words matter. Words have great significance. And notice we see here the salvation of Israel. You never see in the scripture the salvation of Palestine. And I will say this, and I will never come down from this statement, and that is this. When an individual uses the term Palestine and he's supposed to be a believer, this person is in rebellion this person is in darkness this person is interested in pleasing man and not god there is absolutely and i'm going to say this very carefully i'll pause for a moment when a person uses the term palestine they are wanting the praise of man and not wanting to serve god when you use that term you rip from the Bible, the significance and the message of Israel. And what we find here, according to parallelism, and I haven't said much about it in this psalm, but it's here. 
when we look at it, we see that there is a, a parallelism between Sion, a kingdom word, and Israel, Israel. We, we never see God using that word Palestine or the, the basis for it, which is Peleshit, or the Philistines, whenever those words are used, it's not in a kingdom significance, but rather it is in judgment. So when someone uses the term Palestine, when they should be using Israel, they are deceived, they are in darkness, and they have an agenda that is pleasing to the world and is in defiance against the things of God. I would say this. If you are in a congregation and your leader uses that term at times, lovingly share with him. This is not biblically sound. And if he continues to, to use that term, you need to find a different place to worship, a different place to, to serve. This is not God's will for you. And I am most confident in such a statement. Again, who will give from Zion the salvation of Israel? Now, the last part of verse 7 tells us what has to happen for that kingdom establishment, for that salvation of Israel. And what is this? Beshuv Hashem Shevut Amo, which means when the Lord restores the captivity of his people. What does that mean? When he returns the people back to the land. When he takes them out of captivity. And that, my friend, is happening in our days. The fact that there is the nation of Israel, the fact that Jewish people are moving rapidly to the nation of Israel. I live in the southern part of Israel. And I see building going on in an unbelievable rate. High rises going up over and over, and they're occupied. People are coming here. Despite any concern of terrorism and such, people are coming. Why? Because God is returning that captivity of Israel back to the land. And that is of great prophetic significance. You know, it's amazing to me that, that so many so-called Bible teachers, they will twist and look at events and say, boy, this is a prophetic event. This has great significance. I'll give you an example. Here recently, and I won't go into the details, but, but I have literally received probably 30 to 40 emails, most of which I never even deal with but 30 or 40 emails dealing with questions concerning the battle of Gog and Magog. And is this agreement with uh, the United Arab Emirates, is this related to the battle of Gog and Magog? Here's something very important. If you're a believer, you will not be in this world, this planet, alive here on planet Earth when the battle of Gog and Magog takes place. Now, it's fine to study it, understand it, but it's not going to be something that has a personal relevance, meaning you're not going to experience that battle. Now, you know what should be very much of prophetic significance? Three things. One, the rise of Christian persecution. That is prophetic. Those who are suffering for the name Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, whatever language, suffering because of their faith in him. That's significant. Another thing that is very significant has to do with the returning of the Jewish people to the land. Highly significant. One of the most significant prophecies that are taking place in our day. And the third thing, which also has great significance, is how Iran is establishing a coalition of nations, how it's growing in influence, 
that other nations in the Middle East are concerned and how. There are, when you look at Iran and their activity, it's evil. Iran is an evil nation. They support evil activity. They are against the things of God. And I'm speaking about the government, not the Iranian people. But here's the point. You see clear evilness in Iran's political agenda and activity. But you have many European states that want to have good relations. They want to support. They want to do business with. They don't want to have sanctions on them. They want to give them the, the, the ability to have a nuclear program. These are politically significant things, and they have great prophetic implications. So we see here, when the Lord returns the captivity of his people, we should, if you are sensitive to the Spirit of God and prophetic truth, you're going to be doing something because the Jewish people are returning to the land and dwelling in the places, as Isaiah 54 says, these ancient cities are being restored, reestablished. Notice how this psalm ends. Yegel Yaakov Yismach Yisrael. Now, I hope you see that Yaakov, Jacob, and Israel are parallel in the same way as rejoicing and being glad is. The last part of the verse, Jacob will rejoice and Israel will be glad. With what happens when the Jewish people are back in the land? And all of this, all of what we've studied, should cause us to say, yes, there is God. And not just know it inwardly, but demonstrate it outwardly. Because everyone inwardly knows it. The problem is, fewer and fewer people are demonstrating belief, the knowledge of God in their actions. We need to be individuals that say, enough. I am going to be bold in my faith. I am going to take a stand and I'm not going to be concerned with the consequences. I'm going to conclude by saying one thing again was asked a question about uh, is it permissible for congregations and this is being recorded during the time of the coronavirus and again, I want to say once more, it is important for congregations to meet. If you feel led to take certain precautions, fine. Add a few services. Wear a mask if that's appropriate, if that's what the leadership determines. All that's fine, but meet. Meet in assemblies. Come together. And when the authorities they say you can't do that you're going to be fine we're going to arrest you don't waste god's money in going to court now the basis for that is daniel when there was a law that was put into force that you could not pray to anyone other than than the god of the babylonians daniel didn't hire an attorney he didn't go to court what did he do he just did what God commanded him to do. Don't waste money with, with the legal route. Simply worship God. Do that. And whatever the consequences are, leave them to God. Don't worry about, are they going to shut down this place? Are they going to put my parishioners in jail? What? Don't worry about that. Be faithful. To God. Don't be concerned about what you might suffer for taking a stand. That's part of having a testimony. So my, my counsel is be faithful. Don't, don't fight the enemy in their domain, in the court system. Simply do the right thing and trust God is going to move. God is going to manifest himself and God will be glorified because of your faithfulness, regardless of how the world responds. 
Yes, there's a God. Demonstrate your faith in Him. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.